Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Idol Podcast, the podcast where I give a weekly book review. This week, I read Who is Maude Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. Andrews is a commercial copywriter who has worked with the Paris Review and the Huffington Post. Who is Maude Dixon is her debut novel, which was released this past March. The story takes place around Florence Darrow, who is struggling with her professional worth in the writing industry. Through this, we uncover her idolization of the mysterious author, Maude Dixon. All in all, this is ultimately a cautionary tale of ego, pride, and pretend. The first thing we encounter in this book is the preface, of course which is really there to entice the audience to read further. We're thrown into the story with our main character in the hospital. So not only are we asking, why is this character in the hospital? We're also asking who is the main character as the name isn't necessarily clear. Is it Wilcox? Is it Dixon? Helen? Maude? Who is this person? And of course, being the preface, this directly relates to events that we know will come to fruition in the future you know further along in the story so that really helps to you know keep the mystery going there now the book is sectioned into four parts part one giving us the rundown on florence's average life as a writing assistant part two is where we see the foundation of Helen and Florence's professional relationship being built. Part three is the strange trip that they take to Marrakesh and Samat. And part four is the continuation of that trip that also gives us the climax and the reveal of the story. Within those parts are very short chapters, almost choppy, And it seems like that because you're kind of jumping from situation to situation and character to character. And that's just because at the beginning, nothing really makes sense, which, you know, solidifies this book as a fiction mystery. But once you get, you know, towards kind of the second half of the book, you realize that these are breadcrumbs of details that are being left for us to kind of save until the very end to put together the entire picture. So the primary literary element that is used in this book is foreshadowing. So for example, one kind of overt example would be, who is Ma Dixon, the title. So right then and there, we're expecting to get the answer to that. Also recognizing that that's probably going to be a running thing throughout the story. Who is this person? But we also have our characters kind of giving us clues. One would be when Florence um, was thinking to herself that she was running the clock. She was running out the clock on Florence, on herself. And this is in reference to the idea that this job that she's awarded, this trip that she's about to embark on, will change her into a new person, into the person that she wanted to be. We also have the hotel manager in Marrakesh, Brehem, who actually says this out of his mouth. Everyone in Marrakesh is pretending to be someone they're not. So these two things are our characters acknowledging that something is probably going to happen. And it's kind of like that thing where it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. Like you speak something so much into existence that it ultimately happens. But the way I see it as someone in the audience reading this book is that these things are so strange why would they say them out loud? It's not like this is something normal someone would say to someone. So to me that, you know, signifies without even reading the end of the book that this is going to tie into something a little bit later and it does ultimately. But then we also have um, kind of a more subtle approach to the foreshadowing in the example of the the Shergui. Sure, it's spelled C-H-E-R-G-U-I. And this is kind of like the way they described it, like a dust storm, I guess, or a windstorm that brings heat and dust. And according to a local, it brings bad luck. And so 
This is something that is acknowledged almost immediately after arriving in Marrakesh. So we're painting this kind of cloudy, dark, gloomy picture of what is to come from this trip. The first theme that we pick up on automatically is this idea of social standing. And mainly this is all coming from Florence and what she has kind of built up in her head as where things go, like a specific hierarchy. So for example, in the literary world, there's different positions. So you're an assistant, you're an editor, you're a director, but there are different values assigned to each, po each position in the form of salaries, input, responsibility, and respect, most importantly. But also, Florence referencing her upbringing in Florida versus the upbringing of some of her colleagues in New York, it's very different. You know, obviously those are two different places with New York being the center for a lot of, you know, authors and publishing places. It's natural for the people that were raised in New York and in this circle to be more versed on, you know, the, the new up and coming authors versus somewhere like Florida. And so what we see is Florence is reinforcing all of this through comparisons and she's assigning value to things that are foreign to her and the things that she already has. It's kind of lower on the totem pole. This can be seen through her interactions with Amanda, who is a colleague, but also happens to be the daughter of literary nobility. Therefore, she's more valuable because she this runs in the blood, quote unquote. And I say that because her parents were both, um, I think one was a, one taught literature at one of the colleges and another one was uh, an author, an accomplished author or something like that. So she's essentially saying that Amanda is more valuable because of that and she thus is not as valuable as Amanda. So she's already kind of putting herself in a position to fail just by thinking this. And this results in a major writer's block that she can't seem to overcome because she feels inadequate just, you know, from one person. Now, the most prominent theme here is certainly identity. So again, we're going back to the who is Maude Dixon question. This is a literal example. We don't know who this person is. That's why I actually picked up the book because I wanted to know who this person is and why this person was significant but also our characters within the story, they're also trying to figure this out. So there's always this question of identity and uh, people are pulling different uh, examples of the author's work, as well as just things that they come up with on their own to support whatever narrative of who they think this person actually is. And for those of you wondering, we do actually find out who Maude Dixon is in the beginning of part two. So less than 100 pages in, you do find that answer. Now, Florence also has some identity issues. Again, with the whole pre professional identity thing, she is an editorial assistant, and this is kind of like the beginner's level. This is where you enter if you wanna ultimately get up to that top publishing, author, whatever. And so in her mind though, she is above that. And so it's reconciling what is in her head versus what is actually reality that is causing her so much, you know, so many issues is because she doesn't see herself as being an editorial assistant. She honestly believes that that is beneath her. As well as her personal identity, she has a lot going on in just the few chapters in the beginning. For example, to some, she is a mistress. To some, she is a stalker. To her mother, she is the prodigal daughter that was raised in a Florida town where there wasn't much interest in maybe literature and she worked very hard, she excelled, she went to college where some of her high school classmates didn't necessarily go and she moved to New York. But now in New York, she's kind of thrown into this pool of people that are at her same level and now it's time to excel further. And so when I was reading this, it reminded me of that whole, um, and I think someone did a study on this as well, the whole thought that a lot of high school valedictorians, 
they don't often become successful. I'm putting that in air quotes because success is determined by, you know, yourself. But because they're so used to being on top and being above average and they're the small group that they're in, whether it be that town or even that state, that when you get up to a higher level, it's kind of difficult to come to terms with the fact that now you have to push even past what you already are at. So you're no longer the highest achieving person. You're surrounded by high achievers. Now it's time to take it to the next level. And that's tough. That's tough to really, you know, come to terms with. So all of this culminates into her personal view of herself that she is talented, but she is a disappointment in her eyes. She doesn't ever really talk highly of herself, if we're being completely honest, maybe to boast about her writing skills, but she, she ultimately feels like she's not achieving what she should be. And then lastly, with identity, we have this issue of identity theft. So spoiler alert, fast forward maybe a minute or so or 45 seconds, because once we get to part four, we have identity swaps between Florence and Helen. And so this involves them taking on different mannerisms or character traits or even speech patterns to kind of conform to that other person's identity. So throughout the book, we're getting, you know, information on these two characters and now all of a sudden they're kind of switching and it kind of goes back and forth. It's a little bit, it's not necessarily hard to follow. It's just very odd. But so that's a literal, you know, literal implication of identity. And lastly, this last theme I wanted to touch on, I think it's very important, especially in the age of social media. This whole theme of being anti, you know, against the norm, going against the grain. This is something that there's a pull of being an eccentric writer that has a higher level of knowledge that's that doesn't read the normal stuff that other people read, you know, the the stuff that normal people find amazing, they don't find amazing. There's kind of that whole notion going on in this group of um uh, writing assistants and just kind of living up to the stereotype of the snobby artist or the snobby writer, you know, just going against the grain for no reason. Ma Dixon is believed to be a person that is unique, has something that everyone else does not have. And therefore we should follow this person. We should emulate this person because they clearly know something we don't or, you know, strange stuff. Now this really comes out in Helen. Helen consistently battles everything that Florence says. So it's almost like no matter what Florence says out of her mouth, Helen kind of scoffs at it, you know, dismisses it. Whatever she said is not right. You know, Helen knows the best and that's the right way to do things. An example would be when they were in Marrakesh and Florence bought like a purse and Florence so eager to get approval from Helen showed her the purse and Helen was like, so how much did you bargain it down to? And she's like, nothing. It was, you know, cheap. And she's like, well, you know, people look down on Americans, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, seriously, like you, you can't just say, oh, it's cute. Or even if you don't like the purse, be like, oh, that purse is ugly, girl. Why are we going to talk about how you bought it? It's that's one of the many irritating factors about Helen is just going against the grain. No matter what you thought was OK, it's not. And this just to give a more relevant example, this is how I view Kanye West. <laughs> and that's kind of off track, but the type of person that is going against the norm, not because that's what they truly believe, but because they don't want to be lumped in with everyone else. And to anyone out there, like I, all, I know we probably all know someone like that from high school. But if you're doing that, if you're going against the norm because you don't want to be grouped in with people, you're you're letting the norm dictate what you do. So it's like you're almost you're almost not really doing anything significant at all. So that's my little spiel on that. I just felt that vibe throughout the book. Just with the little, you know, writing circle and whatnot. And Florence herself also summed it up when she said that 
outrage seems to be the glue that holds everyone together for example couples friends you know relationships all that good stuff therefore she doesn't partake in outrage so she specifically doesn't become outraged at anything because that's what everyone else does and that's how everyone else forms relationships like i'm not saying outrage is good but really that's your reason for not you know a mess but anyway that is the conclusion of themes so for characters there are really three main characters that we're going to talk about here the first being maude dixon now i'm not going to spoil it for anyone you know that's uh still listening and so there's not much i can say about this character right now but just about you know the author what we know so far is that this author is infamous a lot of people have read mississippi foxtrot which is um Maude Dixon's novel and it's very popular and everyone knows about it and the consensus I get is that people generally like it and that's why they hold Maude Dixon in such a high regard but Maude Dixon is anonymous. Now something interesting about the author is that of course there's a debate over the identity of Maude Dixon and one of the reasons used for someone saying you know the author is clearly a man it's because of the tone. So it has been said that the tone of Mississippi Foxtrot is too harsh and and too, you know, straight to the point to be a female. And that was just something really interesting that I found that even, you know, using the tone you can or you think that you can pin down the author's gender. That's OK. But on to the next one. So Florence, who is the character that we follow the most throughout the story, is very tentative, naive, and unsure. Her personal view is that she's smarter than everyone, but she has a social, social disadvantage. And this goes back to her feeling like because she grew up in Florida, you know, she's not in the in crowd of authors and she's always kind of looking for a way in. She judges her value based on how she measures up to everyone else. So she has said in the book that she's younger, less experienced, made less money, she's not married, and she has no children as compared to her boss, Agatha, who is an editor. Therefore, her opinion is not as valuable. So she second guesses herself a lot. She's also ruled by the opinion of others. For example, she questioned Agatha, who is her boss, question her worthiness after she was dismissed by Simon, who is Agatha's boss. And so, whereas before she held Agatha in such a high regard, once Simon kind of brushed Agatha off, it automatically flips. In her mind now, Agatha is not someone to look up to. She knows more than her. It's a very dangerous way of thinking because you're letting other people dictate how you feel and, and your thoughts about things. And another um, example is Amanda, again, her colleague. After saying that basically roses are not really cool and they're not elegant, now Florence thinks that roses are not elegant or cool. Whereas before she said that she thought that was the epitome of elegance. And now, you know, she kind of laughs it off like, oh, I can't believe I ever thought that. Just because one person said that, like, it's crazy. So now let's jump to Helen. Helen is very curt, very emotionless, direct, and ultimately a, rec a, rec ugh, a recluse. I think I said that right. Which is basically someone that just really isolates themselves and doesn't really want outside contact with anyone. So in my opinion, Helen is a sociopath. And this is because the lack of emotion there was a scene where there was an owl dying in her backyard and was screaming and she just had no emotions at all and just kind of went on eating her dinner like it was another day. And I get it that, you know, people, there's some people that are not animal friendly and they don't like animals, they don't care. But she showed no emotion, complete lack of emotion as this animal is screaming, you know, on the floor until it finally died. And then another thing, another small thing that I picked up on was that when they arrived in Marrakesh, she blatantly lied about being pregnant so that they didn't have to wait in line at the airport. And you may think that's a small thing, but who just lies off the bat like that for something so small? It's not like she's trying to get out of a murder or something. She's trying to 
get out of a line at the airport. So she just said with a straight face right away, yeah, I'm pregnant. So uh, let's go to another line. Homegirl is crazy. She just has a lack of remorse in everything that she does, every aspect, whether she's biting back at Florence or whether she's listening to an animal die or she's looking at the long line of people with children and all types of stuff. She has no remorse. She's also just an unpleasant person all around. She is quoted as saying, Arabs can't drive, and that's why she wants Florence to drive her around. So clearly she's racist. That's cool. She also, um, in a conversation with Florence about fairness, blatantly said fairness doesn't exist. And their conversation I thought was good dialogue, and it was a conversation about equality and, you know, all that good stuff. But for her to just come out and say fairness doesn't exist, it sounds like she's justifying being unfair to other people. That's what it sounds like to me. Now she does contrast Agatha, who is uh, Florence's boss, in the way that Agatha mostly wants from her assistant someone to commiserate with her struggles and validate her beliefs. That's Florence's words exactly. And you know, so Agatha just wants someone to agree with her and just kind of, you know, if she's complaining, just kind of say, yeah, I know. Helen really doesn't want that. Helen just wants you to bow down. And so it's almost like she's not really giving you an option because whatever Helen says, is, that's how it's going to go, period. There's no, you don't need to agree with her because that's, we're going to do it Helen's way. One redeeming quality, though, from Helen the only good thing that came out of her character was her saying to Florence, you make a better life, you don't steal one. This is in response to Florence saying that she hates her life. And so I was thinking the same thing. I was like, listen, if you hate your life, then you need to make it better, okay? Everything is not fair, no. But you have some type of responsibility in this. You can't just see somebody that has everything that you think that you want and just go after theirs and take theirs. That's not how this works. So with that being said, my review. So obviously this book is attracting people who read the title, who's Ma Dixon, and they want to know who Ma Dixon is. And so the intention was to create this, this thriller, this mystery to keep people on the edge of their seats. And although my literal expectations were fulfilled, I did find out who Ma Dixon was. I feel like my plot expectations were left unfulfilled. And that's because all the elements were there to create a thriller, but it never really came together for me. I felt like a good portion of the book was very uninteresting. Like I mentioned before, we find out who Ma Dixon is fairly early on. It was like, it was less than 100 pages. I think it was like 70 or 80 or something like that. And so after that, I'm like, okay, why do I need to keep reading this? And I did something that I never do. I um, flipped to the last page and I read the last page and then I was like, okay, now I have to find out what happened. And so I read through it, but I feel like a good chunk of the middle can be taken out because once you get to like, a good way through part four it starts to pick up but it's still not like I'm not on the edge of my seat I see where she was going when she was writing this but it just I don't know there's something missing for me but it's funny because when I looked this book up and I looked at the reviews and stuff they have pretty average reviews and so no one really disliked it as much as I did so maybe it's just not for me and it wasn't bad, but I will never reread this again. I, I'm over it. I just, I was so frustrated after finding out who Mom Dixon was. Having to read through like the next 150 pages was torture for me. I, it was the worst. But we always have takeaways. So here I have three. So I was very careful about not labeling any particular character as a protagonist or an antagonist. That is because... In my mind, writer's block is the main antagonist of this film, or film, of this book. It's really hot. For all of my visual people out here, you can probably see me sweating. It's hot, okay? <laughs> I'm losing my mind. And I'm really irritated with this book. But 
writer's block is the main antagonist of this book. If you really think about it, for those that have read it, go back to how this all started. This all started because Florence, you know, had writer's block and she had to find some inspiration, which that can all be attributed to her character. But I still think writer's block is the main antagonist. Second is a quote from Nick, one of the fairly minor characters. He says that no one's path is intrinsically better or worse than anyone else's. Not only do I think this is in response to Florence's entire rationale, but this is also something that us as the audience can keep close to our heart. It's really useless for you to become envious of someone else because your paths are different. You have no idea what they went through to get through to get to what they have now and by looking at someone else, you're not even focusing on your own path. Like keep your eyes on the road, which brings me to the very last takeaway, mind your business. Because when you're minding your business, you don't have time to plot on somebody else because you're gonna be working to get your stuff together. I think that Florence should have minded her business and worked on her writing to get better, to get published, and then, you know, go from there. I think Helen definitely should have minded her business, but she's crazy. Just mind your business. I feel like most of these books, that's the takeaway from all of them. Just mind your business. So don't be like Florence. Get your stuff together. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in for another episode. I will see you next week. Hopefully it is cooler. Thank you.